Hello everyone. Thank you, Lara, for that great introduction. So today we're going to talk about invasive reptiles and I'm going to go ahead and say that I talk pretty quickly. So if you do think that I need to slow down, please do, as Lara said, and use your little drop down menu to cue me to slow down. Um, I get very excited about these topics and so I tend to talk quickly. Um, this is also a relatively short webinar, so like Lara said, feel free to ask questions at any time. Please don't be offended if I don't actually respond to you while I'm talking. I will be ignoring the chat until the end. That way, if people would like to stay for questions, they can. So let's go ahead and get started. What I'm going to be talking about today are invasive ex exotic species in Florida and just introduced reptiles in general. We're going to cover a few very basic rules of thumb for identifying each of these reptiles and then where you can report sightings or learn more. So we have about 40 established exotic wildlife species in the state. Um, if you're familiar at all with invasive exotic plants, then you should know that like plants, wildlife are not always problematic if they live here. We have exotic wildlife which were brought in and the cutoff for what's native or what is exotic can get a little murky. It tends to depend on the species, but basically if it's in the historical record as being brought in by someone, either for ornamental or for pet trade, um, it's an exotic or non-native species. There are definitely some controversial plant species, but for wildlife it's a little bit less um, murky. The next level is a naturalized exotic, and naturalized exotics are simply exotic or introduced species which have begun breeding within the state and are also successfully reproducing. So not only are they trying to breed, they're doing a pretty darn good job of it as well. And then there's the even next level, which is the level that is bringing us here today, which is the invasive exotic species. And the invasive exotic species is a species that is not only reproducing, but is expanding in range and maybe altering native ecosystems. And you can alter a native ecosystem in many ways. It can be as simple as being numerous in that area. Um, you could physically be changing the ecosystem by eating a specific plant in large quantities or the way most people think about it is a species that is eating or predating on a native or endangered species. So most of our plants and critters come in um, and don't actually cause issues. But how do they get here? They really get here every way people get here. So anytime you're shipping something or a person, through a plane or a car. A very frequent um, point of entry in Florida are cargo ships. So the Port of uh, Tampa, Port of Miami, Cape Canaveral, those type of areas, we have a larger number of introduced species through the ports than I would guess through planes or trains um, or cars. But planes absolutely, especially in Miami, because we have a lot of international flights coming into Miami, if you think you're going to get caught with something, people tend to let it go right outside the airport. So that's not a great thing to do. But how many of our introduced species actually become a problem? If you work at all with plants, then you're probably familiar with the rules of um, the rule of tens. And that rule of tens says that roughly 10% of introduced species will become established. Of that 10% that becomes established, about 10% of those will become invasive. However, most of that research has been done on plants. Some of the research that's starting to be completed regarding herp species, and a herp species is a reptile or an amphibian, um, suggests that it could be as high as 60 or 70 percent. And this makes sense logically. If you think about where a lot of these reptiles and amphibian species come from, they tend to be swampy type areas around the world. And our ecosystems are very similar both in weather and in habitat style. And so it makes sense that these animals would do really, really well here. Whereas a lot of the plant species that come in may be used as packing material. They may come from a completely different ecosystem than what we've got here in Florida. But we do have that nice, warm, year-round um, weather and tend to have some swampy areas that the amphibians uh, can take over at. So on the menu today, we are going to talk about black and white tegus. You might also know them as Argentine tegus. 
the Nile Monitor and introduced iguanas. I will be covering iguanas as a group. And then we're also going to talk about the probably the most famous invasive wildlife in Florida, which is the Burmese python. And just for fun, we're going to talk about the toke gecko, which is something that most people have not heard of unless you're in the reptile trade industry or pet trade, um, or if you have one as a pet. But they're pretty cool little animals. And then finally, we're going to talk about Cuban tree frogs. While they're not technically a reptile, they are an amphibian. Um, they are a species that most people in Florida have seen or are familiar with. So we're going to make sure to talk about them a little bit. Before I get started on these species, though, I do want to let you know I'm going to be very brief in each one of these species. I'm not trying to give you the, you know, the encyclopedia explanation of each one of them. I'm giving you a, a brief introduction to what they might eat and what they might look like. Um, if you have any specific questions about these animals, we'd be more than happy to answer them at the end to the best of our ability. So what can you do to manage wildlife? Um, I bring this up before we get into species because we really want to make sure that people understand why it's important to learn about them. And the biggest reason is that if you are one of the people who might help us manage the wildlife by killing or trapping that in introduced species, we want to make sure you're not accidentally killing one of our native species. Um, to the untrained eye, a lot of these animals look very similar, and we do not want to cause harm to our native species. Um, and then additionally, we want to reduce the frequency of false reports. We have very few people statewide when you compare it to other industries that are working with invasive wildlife, and most of the time, it's volunteers. And so we want to reduce the number of times that they're called out to a site for an animal that's either not invasive or exotic. So it, we want to reduce the chances that they're brought in for a native species. But also, there's only certain invasive or exotic species that we're interested in sending someone out to actually go capture, because those are the ones that are problematic. So this first one right here, I'm going to ask you a poll question. Does anyone know what this is? And I think Lara is going to bring up the poll question. There we go. So you can just go ahead and vote right there. And we'll wait until we get most people to vote on it. All right. Well, that's probably pretty good, Lara. We can end it there. All right. So you guys were absolutely correct. Most people guessed that this was the Argentine tegu. You are correct. It's also known as the giant tegu or black and white tegu. They can grow up to about four feet. Um, general rule of thumb for wildlife and plants in Florida, though, whatever the upper limit of it is, there's a good chance there's at least one in Florida that's gotten larger. Um, but tegus are generally top out about four feet. They tend to be um, omnivores, which means they eat plants and animals. However, like most of our introduced reptile species, they will really eat anything they can get their mouth on. We're currently doing research right now to see if they are going to impact native or endangered species, because there are some reports that they are eating young gopher tortoise. So we want to make sure that we are aware of that, if that's the case. They do use burrows or dig their own burrows to brew mate, which is a reptile version of hibernating during cold or cool weather. And so that's one of the reasons that they prefer dry and sandy soils. They do use gopher tortoise burrows, but we are not entirely sure if they're using exclusively abandoned burrows or if they're using burrows that the gopher tortoise are currently using. Those eggs will hatch in early summer after being laid during their brew mate period. And they can lay up to 35 eggs a year. So if you look at this map on the right hand of the, the PowerPoint slide, these are the current reported sightings of the tegu. So our biggest populations are right on the Hillsborough, Polk County border, and down in the Everglades in Miami-Dade. Um, these are a species that are very comfortable in semi-urban areas. And they are not thought to be big enough to attack most pets of any kind unless the pet attacks them. Uh, but they might be eating little things like um, small frogs, lizards, mangoes that fall off the tree, things like that. So our next poll question, what species is this?
All right, well, that's pretty good as far as the number of people. Thank you, Lara. Um, the answer was the Nile Monitor, so congratulations to most of you. Don't know why you guys are here. You know everything. Just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, the Nile Monitor can grow up to be about five to seven feet in length, and they are much more aquatic than our um, Argentine tegus are. They're generally found in or around canal systems. And if you look at the map to the right, you'll notice we have far less reports of a Nile Monitor. I do want to mention that does not necessarily mean there are less of them in Florida. It just means they are reported less. Um, for comparison, I looked up the, um, the hog a few months back, and there are less than 50 reports of hogs. So as you're probably aware, we have lots of hogs in Florida. But back to the Nile Monitor, if we look at his picture right here, you'll notice on the neck it's got a slanted yellowish pattern on his neck. If you look at that from above, it, it creates a V-shape or a chevron pattern on the top of the neck, and they tend to lift their head up so that they can see better. And when they do that, they have a very long-looking neck when you All right, I was kicked out for a moment. Can you guys hear me? If you raise your hand, if you can hear me. Wonderful. All right, apologies for that. I must have been in the Adobe Connect session a little bit too long, so it kicked me out. Um, anyway, so back to the Nile Monitor. They lay eggs and bury them, much like our alligator species and crocodiles do. They tend to eat small mammals, birds, reptiles, eggs, and fish. Remember, they are semi-aquatic. So they do eat things that hang out near the water. As I said, they've got that long neck. And to look at it here, the pictures at the top are Argentine tegus. And the pictures at the bottom are the Nile Monitor. So if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see how the Nile Monitor lifts his head up like that. And you can see just how long his neck is. When you compare it to the picture right above um, the Nile Monitor there, you'll see how short and and uh, stocky the Argentine tegu's neck is. Additionally, the Argentine tegu has a, a rounded tail where the Nile monitor has that thin tapered tail at the top. Both of these species can move very quickly just like our alligators can, so don't underestimate their speed, but they shouldn't in most cases be aggressive. Um, it is possible for them to be aggressive just like any other animal. They do have personalities. But on the whole, their first instinct will be to run away, or in the monitor's case, jump in the water and swim away. So this next critter that we're going to talk about is the iguana. And I've got several pictures of them because they do vary so much in color. But the first thing I'd like you to notice is if you look at the tail of this iguana, he does have that black striped tail that's very similar to the tegu. So these, um, these lizards can often, when you only have a picture of the tail sticking out of the bushes, be mistaken for a tegu. But these are the iguanas. We've got several introduced species, and they range in color from this kind of olive brown gray color to bright, bright green color. Um, these, both of these pictures were taken in Big Pine Key in the Florida Keys. And then we've even got some other ones um, here, like the black spiny tail iguana, which, as you'll notice, does not actually have spikes down his back. But he does have those black stripes, and they, um, they vary in, in color, as you can see. So our introduced iguanas are most commonly found between three and four feet in length. Um, they do 
reproduce in great numbers. So you may see many, many, many little ones, but they tend to be about three or four feet when, when I hear about them most commonly. If you look at the reports to the right, you'll notice that most of them are in the Palm Beach County area of the state. Um, don't be, don't be um, alarmed by that. They're not super aggressive, but they are very numerous. So I have a friend who works for the Riviera Beach Fire Department, and I get pictures every winter when the iguanas come out to bask in their uh, driveway, and they'll have 30 or 40 of them in their driveway. That's how numerous these lizards can get. If you've been down to the Keys recently and gone boating through the canal systems in between the islands trying to get to other areas of fishing, you'll notice they are all over the rocky cliffs down there. In mating season, the males have a very beautiful coloration to them. They can get bright, bright orange around the neck, and they are absolutely gigantic down there. Now, the good news is they're not thought to be harming native species because while they are omnivores and will eat what they can get, they tend to focus more on our tropical fruits. They're, they eat more fruit than they do other animals. And so in the southeast part of the state, down into the Keys and southwest Florida, we do have a lot of trees that produce fruit for them. Um, so that's mainly what they're, they're feasting on down there. They are quite an urban nuisance, but they're not thought to be hugely problematic in the native areas or the natural areas. Um, they're just, people don't like having them. When it gets cold out, they can fall out of trees. People try to collect them thinking they're dead. And then when they warm up in the car, all of a sudden they've got a lot of live lizards in the car. And, as you can imagine, that's problematic. The good news is we think that they are going to be limited to South Florida at the maximum Central Florida. They are limited due to cold weather, um, as I just mentioned. So if we have several warm winters in a row, they may move farther north. But for the most part, they're going to stay in the south part of the state. So this next critter we're going to talk about is the Burmese python. And they are in most probably the most famous of our invasive wildlife at this point. The easiest way to identify this particular um, python species is with the giraffe spots on the back of the snake. And just for identification purposes, I'd like you to note how thick this snake is. So if you look at the curve on the left side of his body there, you will notice how heavy he looks for the length that he is. And these snakes can get pretty small for their size when they ball up like that. And it's very difficult to tell how large they are. For that reason, I don't recommend that you try and take on a Burmese python by yourself if you find it. Um, they often are a lot longer than they look. So the average captive si captured size of the Burmese python is six to nine feet. However, they do get much, much larger. In 2013, they caught one in the Everglades that was almost 19 feet long. And I thought a few months ago we had another record setting python, but I could not find the press release for it. So we're going to leave it at 18.8 for now. The, like I said, they have those giraffe spots around the back. They're dark spots with a yellowish orange glow behind them, and the dark parts of those spots rarely touch. They are semi-aquatic and found mostly in very South Florida. They have been found around the state, although the isolated populations in Central Florida and northward are considered to most likely be pet releases that happen to be seen. Um, if you're in South Florida and you're really interested in seeing one, going through Everglades National Park in very South Florida, I would recommend looking along canal banks and on the road after particularly cool evenings. They do have a varied diet, and we are doing a lot more research right now trying to figure out exactly what they eat in the Everglades because about the same time that Burmese python populations started increasing, small mammal populations started decreasing. So there's a correlation between the number of small mammals and the number of Burmese python. However, there are a lot of other factors that could affect the, the mammal population down there, like altered water th flow through the Everglades. So this next species is quite pretty if you're into lizards. Um, this is your tokay gecko. This picture was taken in St. Petersburg in 2013, found at someone's house. Uh, living on the outside of the garage, I believe. As you can see, something nipped his tail, so he's currently in the process of regrowing it. But this bright coloration is the easiest way to identify the tokay gecko. 
they get to be up to 12 inches in length. And you can see in this picture, they, they have a presence about them. If you imagine that plant behind them um, is probably a small landscaping plant. These, these lizards can get quite large, and they'll just hang out just like any of the other geckos you see at your house. They range in color from a dusky gray to a bright blue, but they do almost always have these bright orange pattern to them. They can, like I said, they, oops, they can get up to about 12 inches as length, and they're very available as a pet. They're a very popular pet. In fact, a lot of people who have them as pets just let them roam around the house like you might a cat or dog. They eat other insect or they eat insects, so they're um, used as an internal um, pest control option for some people. They also eat other lizards, frogs, and potentially other small mammals um, due to their size. So that's that can be concerning, but we don't have any research to suggest that they're seriously problematic. If you look at the reports on the right-hand side, this is actually probably one of our more widely reported gecko or introduced reptile, simply because it is quite distinctive in its coloration and very easy to see. We do have a population of them breeding in Lakeland. Um, we're not super concerned about that population. They tend to stay in urban areas, and they're not thought to be altering the native ecosystem. So at that point, we're going to go ahead and get another poll question from Lara. So for the Toke gecko, based on what I've said, what type of species is it? All right, well, that's probably pretty close to everyone, Lara. Okay, so we've got an even split between exotic species and naturalized exotic species. I'm going to go ahead and say that the correct answer is naturalized exotic species because we do know we have several um, breeding populations in Florida, but they're not necessarily problematic. So while exotic species is not incorrect, they are definitely exotic, we do know that they're breeding, which makes them naturalized. The next species we're going to cover is the Cuban tree frog. As you can see, we have lots of variation in this species. Um, the easiest way to identify them is to look at a lot of them. Honestly, that sounds crazy, but you need to be able to differentiate the, the foot side, the toe pad size, which are the little ends of their toes there, um, how bug-eyed they can be, because our native species, some of them are slightly bug-eyed, and an easy way to identify them is after they get super, super big. So our native species will not get bigger than two and a half inches, whereas these Cuban tree frogs will get much larger, and once they're that big, people don't like catching them because they're, they can hop pretty far when they're that big. But as you can see, they can have a pattern to them, like the tree frog on the top, they might be an iridescent bluish green color, but most frequently they're going to have an off-white or creamy color to them. In comparison, this is one of our native frog species, the squirrel tree frog, and while in this picture his eyes do look pretty big, I'm fairly confident that is just due to the angle and the flash that was used to take the picture. But if you look at the skin, you can tell quite clearly that he's got a very smooth skin to him, and he's got much smaller toe pads. So this illustration kind of um, shows you quite clearly how different the toe pad size can be. But if you're not familiar with identifying amphibians, and you've only got one of them in front of you, it can be tricky to say for sure which one it is. Um, we have many species of tree frogs in Florida, and even the squirrel tree frog can be about seven or eight different colors. So if you're ever not sure, feel free to send a picture to Lara or myself or your regional FWC office, and we'll be more than happy to help you identify what, um, what kind of tree frog you're looking at. In general, though, they've got the large toe pads, the big eyes, and they're a big, big frog. I mean, I had one in my house the other day that must have been about five inches of cross. So they get quite large. They will often have reddish eyes, and as you can see from the map here, they are found all over Florida. If you or you know someone who is in the panhandle and starts seeing large populations of these, we do ask that you contact myself or Lara so we can get you in contact with the researcher currently working with Cuban tree frogs. 
Currently, the entire peninsula of Florida has Cuban tree frogs, but they're just starting to move into the panhandle. And so Dr. Johnson is trying to track that right now. If you are willing to do so, we do encourage residents to humanely euthanize Cuban tree frogs. And there, when we say humanely, the reason for that is while we might be putting them down, we do not want them to suffer in any way during that time. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to show any pictures, but basically what we're asking you to do, if you are willing to do so, is to capture the frog in a zip talk bag that you um, flip over your hand backwards so you have a way to grab him. Um, you don't want to squish or hurt him in any way, so please be careful when you're grabbing them. You can also use gloves, but the reason that's important is they secrete a mucus through their skin, which can be really, really irritating to people, especially people who are sensitive to a lot of food allergies, it just if you're that type of person who has sensitive skin and reacts to things, we want you to go ahead and make sure you're wearing gloves just in case. So you can liberally apply that benzocaine, which you can find at any local drugstore. Um, they are this chemical is frequently used as a gel to numb a toothache. It's also used in various first aid creams. I believe there are even some burn sprays that have it, but we want to make sure that there's at least 20% benzocaine because that is the, the um, concentration that will make the frog go to sleep in the nicest possible way. Um, after your frog is unconscious, you can go ahead and seal him in the bag and put it in the freezer overnight. At that point, the next morning, you can go ahead and just throw him in the garbage can. Um, or if you're the type of person who would like to bury the tree frog, you are more than welcome to do so at that point. He is most likely dead at that point. Cuban tree frogs, um, the reason that we're encouraging people to go ahead and euthanize them is really twofold. Our native tree frogs are already suffering from habitat loss. Um, they're a little bit more particular about where they will breed. They need cleaner water, more natural conditions, and in Florida with our rapid population growth, they're already suffering from that um, habitat loss. Additionally, Cuban tree frogs do frequently eat our native species because they are so much bigger than the native species that our native species then become a prey item. Um, so that is something that is concerning to a lot of the researchers working on this. Um, there's a there's a another way that you can identify them. I was just uh, reminded by our colleague Ken Gioli. There is if you're if you have gloves on and you can touch the top of his head, the the skin on the Cuban tree frog is fused to the skull bone, and so you can try to wiggle the skin on the top of the head. That is an optional way to identify them. So now we're going to go over the basic rules of thumb on how to identify your, your um, introduced species. These only work for the species that we currently know to be breeding in Florida. As you know, anytime you give a rule, there is always an exception. So these tips work for species we already know to be here. If it's a lizard and you're not sure if it's native, an easy way to tell is if it's over 12 inches in length and not an alligator or crocodile, it's not supposed to be here. We don't have any native species that are over that size that are not a young alligator or crocodile. Um, the picture that I've got here is a small American alligator, and you can tell by the stripes if you've never seen a small alligator. Um, the stripes can make it look like something you're not familiar with. Uh, but all of our little alligators do have that, so that's a great way to identify small alligators. Oh, I hit the wrong button again. For the snakes, there is one concern when you're looking at snake identification. The general rule of thumb is if it's a very large snake, looks heavy, and has shiny scales, it's not supposed to be here. We would just like to emphasize that it needs to have a pattern to it. The snake in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide is an eastern indigo snake. And these snakes can get quite big. That one in the picture is about six feet in length. And they do look heavy compared to our other native snakes. By comparison, the snake on the right is a green anaconda that was found in Osceola County. We believe it was a pet release. But if you look at that snake, compared to how long he is, he's very thick and muscular. Um, being, being a constrictor, it makes sense. but. For whatever reason, the introduced constrictors are much, much heavier looking than our native 
snake species. So that bold pattern, regardless of the introduced um, snake species, they all have a large pattern to them. There are very different shapes and colors to them. But if it's a snake that's over six feet long, has shiny scales and a bold pattern, and looks heavy, there's a good chance it's not supposed to be here. Additionally, we're more concerned about large snake introductions than we are about a lot of other things. So we encourage you, if you think you've got one that's not supposed to be here, to go ahead and, and give um, the, the reporting hotline a call. So who do you call? This is the phone number you call if you have a live sighting of an animal. Um, the only, <coughs> excuse me, um, I would call this phone number if you think you have a tegu, any kind of introduced snake or a Nile monitor. If you'd like to call um, for an iguana, they may or may not actually come out and look for it. Um, the, the purpose of this hotline is to send professionals out to go find that critter and bring it in for research purposes. So they will humanely euthanize the critter or find someone to adopt it out to. But most of the time it will be necropsied after it's been euthanized and that way they can try and analyze the gut and see what, pe what these critters are eating. They will also come get um, species that you have trapped if you've trapped a tegu, a monitor, or a python or other introduced large snake. If you just have a picture or if you found a roadkill animal, you can go ahead and identify it and submit it to ivegotone.org. If it is one of those three species, the tegu, monitor, or python, even if it is roadkill, you can go ahead and call that hotline. Um, they may just ask you to take a picture and report it online, though. And where can you learn more? We do have a great training available on our wildlife website. If, if you can't remember this uh, website, you can, I think you can click on this link now if you'd like. But if for whatever reason you need to find this in a week and you can't think about it, just Google REDDY reptile training and it is the first thing that comes up. It'll be really easy to, um, to find this. And basically it teaches you what to look for, adjusting what you, what you see um, when you look at the canal, for instance. Do you see a monitor or do you see grass? That sort of thing. So that is all I have for you guys today. Down in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the Invader Updater and the web resources. These are lots of information for these species if you're interested in learning more. Other than that, I'd be happy to go ahead and answer any questions you might have. Lara, um, if you've been keeping track of the questions, if you could let me know what those were, I'd be happy to answer some. I see you've been answering some too, which yeah, is awesome. I tried to answer along the way. There was some concern with um, potentially burying the frog in the soil and the benzocaine, uh, I suppose, leaching into the soil and causing contamination. But um, I wasn't aware of any research on that, but I would just suggest to dispose of it in the garbage can and then we can avoid that issue. <laughs> yes i would agree with that the garbage can is definitely the the most recommended way um sometimes people don't like doing that it's impersonal so if you're going to bury them you do not want to do it in a plastic bag um but at, like lara said i'm not aware of any research on bids of cane leaching into the soil and being problematic i see will the presentation be available for download or additional viewing yes it will be available on both lara and my website and we will send an email out when it is available we'll also send the survey out to everyone although you can just click on the link currently on the screen to take our survey which we would really really appreciate as soon as we figure out where it will be hosted we will send you that link While everyone is talking, yeah, if you guys are leaving, please take a minute to provide uh, feedback on the link on your screen um, and, you know, check out the other webinars that we have coming up. Um, there was uh, just a mention earlier as well about um, some aggressiveness of the Nile monitors. Um, I believe the experience was from South Africa, but just to be cautious, and I think you kind of mentioned that, you know, the idea is mostly for us to help be extra eyes out there to help report these invasive mm -hmm. species. So we definitely don't want to be approaching them ourselves unless um, we're a trained professional. 
there are um, there are trainings available if you would like to learn how to be one of the people who go out and help find these critters. They're called Python patrols, and you can find those through your local CISMA or through your local uh, regional FWC office. If you're in Polk County, our office is in Lakeland. I'm sorry, FWC's office is in Lakeland. I don't work for FWC. Um, they'd be more than happy to direct you towards that as well. So there was two other questions I saw. One was, do you have to register for each of the future webinars? Um, and yes, we do ask that you do that. We kind of debated how we wanted to do um, the registration, but decided it would uh, be a lot easier logistically for us um, to have you guys register for each one. So yeah, please take a minute to do that if you're interested in future webinars. Um, and there was another question about if these species, I believe referring to all of them, um, if any of them are nocturnal. Yes, the tokay gecko and the Cuban tree frog are primarily nocturnal. The other species, the, um, the tegus, the pythons, the monitors, those tend to be um, out and about during the day. The pythons and the monitors may be more active in the morning and in the early evening. I would have to double check that. The tegus, though, are active in the middle of the day, just the warmest part. You'll see tegu tracks around um, sandy hiking trails, for instance. And, um, but most of them are, are operational during the day, except the gecko and the tree frogs. And I navigated back. Somebody asked if we could provide the ready web link again. I think we have that in our web resources. Maybe I thought it was in there, but it might not be. But I'll leave that uh, link. It doesn't look like I can copy and paste it up there. OK, they got it. And and I'll go back to here. So yeah, please help us spread the word about our future webinars. We'd love, you know, the more the merrier for this. Um, and we definitely appreciate your, your time and attention and hope you enjoyed your lunch while you learned a little bit. Yes, thank you so much for your interest. We love having people ask questions too. So you guys have been great. Thanks.